Listen to part of a university lecture in political science. Now, we're all familiar, I think, with the United Nations Organization, and we're very accustomed to a world divided into nations. But many of you may not realize how recent the idea of the nation-state really is. Most of the history of civilization's been a history of much smaller units, from primitive tribes to Greek city-states, and later much of the larger units usually called empires. The concept of a political and cultural nation as we know it today didn't appear until near the end of the 18th century, at the time of the French and American revolutions. Let's look at a couple of terms first just to make them clear. Strictly speaking, a nation is a cultural concept, a group of people in a particular area who are usually defined as sharing a common history common traditions, the same language or ethnic origin, etc. A state, on the other hand, is a political concept. It's a political unit, an administrative unit, a territory controlled by a government. So what we're talking about here, nation states, what we often call countries, are those areas where these two concepts, nation and state, are roughly congruent where they coincide in time and space. And this is the basic structure, the infrastructure of civilization of the world we see today, the basis upon which treaties are signed, on which wars are fought, and for which people often die. One historian has said that a nation state is an imaginary community because the citizens of even the smallest nation state will never meet all their fellow citizens, or even hear about them. Yet in each citizen's mind is some image of oneness, of unity with his fellows. Some think that this image is the direct result of the development of printing, and the popular press, which likewise expanded in the 18th century, and which in its language and its audience has helped define these national communities. Well, imagined or not, nation states are very real to us today. In fact, they seem like the only natural form for society in spite of their very recent origins, don't they? But at that same time, they seem to be the cause of so much turmoil in our world. Wars, nuclear standoffs, ideological conflicts, conflicts over resources and markets. The list seems endless. So maybe we'd better take a more careful look at the factors that seem to contribute to the idea of nation-statehood. First, geography is an obvious factor. Countries like Japan and New Zealand have very clear boundaries, and their physical isolation makes these nations very homogenous. However, geography is often irrelevant. Ireland and Cyprus are certainly very strong, divided islands. And many countries, notably African countries, have boundaries that have nothing to do with natural features or ethnicity or anything else. They are simply straight lines drawn in the last century by former colonial powers. And then there's language, which is also used as a rationale for nationhood. The United States and Germany and France are all large, successful states that are defined mostly by language. But on one hand, many international boundaries cut directly across language lines, as with Belgium and the Netherlands, while on the other hand, countries like South Africa and India include speakers of many different languages. And a common ethnicity, that is, a common genetic background and a common cultural heritage, have certainly helped determine the identity of many nation states. Nevertheless, many larger countries like China are composed of many ethnicities, while other ethnic groups, like the Kurds, for instance, are conspicuously stateless. Finally, one more major determinant is religion. Religion has also played a big part in defining nations, Catholic Ireland, Buddhist Nepal, and of course Jewish Israel. But again, many states suffer internal strife, violent conflict, on account of religious differences. Iraq being the most obvious current example. So it should be clear to you that none of these factors are foolproof definers of the nation state. 
In fact, they often complicate the situation. Would it then be reasonable, therefore, if we divided Iraq, for instance, into three nations, into Sunni and Shiite and Kurdish nations? Would that solve many of their problems? Probably not. Drawing lines usually just creates new problems. Minorities become smaller minorities. Surrounding states endure altered confrontations. The fracturing of other states is encouraged and redrawing a state's boundaries wrongly suggests that conflicts, ethnic and religious and linguistic conflicts, can be decided by dividing peoples, when the real solution probably lies in trying to unite them, lies in recognizing individual rights, in devolving power to the local level, and in a sort of pan-nationalism that focuses on maximizing cooperation among nation-states and in that way minimizing the impact of hard boundaries poorly defined by any factor. This is what is happening so successfully with the European Union, the organization which we'll be taking a closer look at now.